you found a way again through a, a I think an amazing set of circumstances to make it to South Korea. I mean, it's a, frankly a miracle that you made it mm -hmm. through the Gobi Desert mm -hmm. in the middle of the night at minus 40. Yeah. Which, by the way, minus 40 Celsius and Fahrenheit, the same for, <laughs> for all the viewers. And yeah. it's really, really cold. Yeah. No map. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was, it was with missionaries that guided, that, that basically put you up to it. How, how did that work? So while I was in China, uh, we knew this other North Indian factory woman. She met the missionaries and they said, if we come to their shelter and study Bible and become Christian, and somehow if we prove our faith to them that we are Christians, they were going to help us to go to South Korea. And then so we joined the shelter and they taught me about like God and Jesus Christ, all of that. And once somehow we proved our faith to them, that's when they told us, okay, if you know, escape from China, you have to walk across the frozen Gobi Desert and using a compass in your hands. Because it was like the chance of making in the desert is so low. They cannot even come with us, right? How do you go back? And that's why they were just letting us go in the desert with a compass and told us to go to the west and north between those directions. And eventually I followed the Northern Star and I mean, literally just in the middle of the desert, in the Northern Star praying and that leads to, hopefully that leads to freedom. And it did, it really did. So it was a, well, I have seen so many miracles in life. So, you know, you described that you make it, you made it to South Korea through Mongolia. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they set up some false papers for you. They flew you over. It was your first flight. It's just, again, it's such an unbelievable telling tale. I hope everybody reads your book. The, what I found this moment um, where you know you're now in South Korea, mm. you've gone through the I guess it's like a basically government training camp to learn the vocabulary mm. to be able to function in the society. You know, you were saying that the language is so controlled. There's so all these elements, and you know you've been through what you've been through. Mm -hmm. You know, and you go. I think you went to an internet cafe, mm. but the person was kind of. You know, I don't know, it's not, is it, I guess, racist against North Koreans, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and it crushed you yeah. and you wanted to hide. And so I, I thought this is just, again, the, you're talking about the complexity of the human psyche, right? Mm -hmm. You've been through so many things mm -hmm. that most of the people watching this show mm -hmm. couldn't even imagine, mm -hmm. right? And so, but here with this, you know, you know, punk in the internet cafe, you know, being the way he is, sort of biased against uh, North Koreans, it crushes you and hurts you so much. It's, it's just, it's fa it, I thought that was such a fascinating moment. I mean. Yeah. It's now actually it makes me think what it was, right? Like North Koreans are so strong, right? They be trafficked. They go through so unbelievable things and willing to be free and go to South Korea and be free. And they are the highest group in South Korea to commit suicide. So you would think like these people are tough as a like, rock or steel. And then why on earth they go to South Korea and kill themselves after all that suffering? And I think what it is to me at least right now is one that we had a different expectation. When we are going to South Korea, we are promised of freedom and justice. And when we are going to China, we're just looking for food. Right, like the motivation to go to China is very primitive thing, survivor, getting food. But from China to South Korea is a lot dangerous journey. So North Korean regime wouldn't execute you if you're not trying to leave China and then just find food and go back to North Korea. They would like send you to prison camp. But if they do find out that you're trying to escape to South Korea, that's where you get executed or sent to lifetime concentration camp. So even the sentences are different. And that's why when you go to South Korea, it is literally the ultimate step. And what do you risk your life for? That's when you risk your life for freedom. And I think that's why when you go to South Korea, we got somehow different expectation. That we think South Korea is going to be a, like our people, right? Like they're not Chinese, like speaking same Korean. So going there, being discriminated by your own people, 
and then being discriminated being what, right? <laughs> so I think expectation is really different. And there's the loneliness that you feel. In China, like you are so busy surviving, you don't even think about what loneliness is, right? Every single second is struggle to survive in China. But when you go to South Korea, finally your basic needs are met. You have at least food and ramen. Then you start thinking about the people that you lost in the journey, the people you left behind. And I think that's why life is a lot harder in South Korea. I mean, not harder, but it still feels such a struggle adjusting to South Korea in the beginning. When did you realize there was such a thing as freedom? I heard the freedom when I was in China. This defector lady told me, let's go to South Korea. There, we're going to be free. And then I was like, what is free? Right? And then she's like, oh yeah, we can wear jeans there. And then you can watch South Korean K-dramas. Because I love the K-dramas. And then it's like, nobody was going to arrest you for that. So back then, my thought of freedom was not like freedom of speech or none of this. I thought, okay, if I go to South Korea, then I can wear jeans and I can watch TV for free. So I was like, okay, why don't we risk our life for that? <laughs> right? I mean, even that was sounded to me. It was like unbelievable freedom. Like how anybody have freedom to wear jeans. And that's, that's what I thought of freedom back then at 15. So somewhere along the way, you know, and this is, I think I said at the beginning that I've kind of realized following you a bit that, you know, truth telling seems to be your main life purpose these days. So first, mm -hmm. of, first of all, is that fair yeah, to say? Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> um, somewhere along the way, you realize that this is, I guess, the best way to help your fellow North Koreans, right? How did that happen? Where, where, did, where did this understanding come from? I think, uh, I mean, in a way, like in the past, when I was giving testimonies, right, even writing that book, it was unbelievably painful to relive all thing. I remember, like, writing parts about China, losing my father. Like, I lost my father again by writing that part. So, like, literally, when I crossed the desert, I felt like I left the desert again. Right? It was a very painful thing to relive the whole thing. And even still to this day, like even when I was doing the, the Joe Rogan interview, I, after that I got crushed. And it's a, it's a thing like you let all the pain to feel again. And back then I did not understand that was important. You know, it was a very intangible thing. How much difference are you actually making even? But the thing is, after I was reading uh, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Words for Life, uh, during the pandemic, thankfully, I was able to read a lot of books again and kind of re like I re understood again that why it mattered. Like in the time of this sit, telling the truth is the only brave, it's the courageous thing you can do, right? I do think the world that we are living in is as much as I don't want to admit in America right now, it is a time of this sit. It's just so much lies. Truth are so hard to find, and they're also making it hard to find. They're creating so much chaos unnecessarily, so people get confused. And in this time, if you think you know the truth, I think that telling that is the only thing you can do to make the world a better place, and as simple as that. And that realization just came to me last year, and I think that's why I'm devoting my life for that right now. I mean, all I can say is, wow and yes and how important telling the truth at any time but especially at a time when let's say deceit is on the rise <laughs> <laughs> so prevalent at this point is not even rising i think everywhere you see the you see the like lie and it is so heartbreaking to see that i i imagined america to be way better than this I had no clue this is what was going on, you know. When you see America from the far away, it's still the land of hope, right? The home of braves, like such a country that stood for justice so many years. And this country had that exceptional moralism, that bravery when it comes to freedom and individual liberty. It inspired me so much. And then coming here, looking at inside, I was just like baffled, like how is this impossible? 
And I, of course, I called America in the time of when the Trump was becoming president in a very unusual time when the country becoming so divided. And people keep telling me this is not what America used to be from both sides, I'm saying. So in a way, it's almost my fate that I need to fight for freedom <laughs> wherever I go. <laughs> no, I mean, that's very fascinating. I mean, you were, you know, and this this was in this the interview you did with Jordan Nick Peterson. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about how incredibly disillusioning it was for you to go to Columbia University. And it's frankly, the, the whole discussion is kind of mind blowing because, I mean, this is one of the, supposed to be one of the premier educational institutions in America for sure, in the world pro mm. probably, yeah. right? And you, I think you said that you, there was zero classes mm. that ultimately were worthwhile for you. But, but how is that even possible? Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. I was, I mean, I was thirst for truth. I was thirst for knowledge after North Korea where I had so much hunger for, you know, the sad part about being in North Korea is not just like you're starving and misery everywhere, that you are not even connected to your own humanity. You don't even learn the time before Kim's, right? North Korean calendar begins when Kim Il sung was born, like Ju Taewon. And then they don't even tell you that, I didn't even know that I was Asian. They told me that I was Kim Il sung race. So I thought, okay, I'm Kim Il sung race, right? And, and so like, there was so much beyond my, my being in the lineage of humanity, the struggle that we went through coming all the way to this place. It was such a long history that you find that the connection, that thing was completely cut off. So coming here, even like reading Jane Austen, like reading like Shakespeare, like people who were, came way, 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 way before me, the humans who thought certain ways. And that was so beautiful, like coming here, that we discovering my lineage as a human being in a long, long, long with my ancestors. And of course, now like going to Colombia, they try to, right, like, I mean, they say like reading Jane Austen, you're subconsciously being brainwashed because she was living in the time of the white colonialism and racism, so she was a bigot. So that's how you got subconsciously brainwashed, and this is a called like sensitive training. You look for the hidden oppression everywhere. Uh, and then like every single class, the conclusion is that American foundation is a bigot. The foundation, the constitution is like a bigotry, and the racism, white supremacist. The only way we can do this again is tearing down every single thing that we have and rebuild the, whatever the paradise they are describing. And this is thing cities implanted by every single person going to Colombia. And it didn't matter what the evolution class, even I told you like one of the Jordan Peterson was asking me, is there one class that changed your mind, what would that be? And I was like, yeah, that evolution class was so fascinating. Like, I don't know what Homo erectus was. Homo habilis, right? I don't know, but the, even that class, the conclusion was about the the side of the white men's aggression. So it was just so heartbreaking that academia could not be away from this ideology. It's just it's not about discovering the truth, right? It's all about being politically correct, and it's just heartbreaking. This is seeing the suicide of Western civilization. Yeah. <laughs> 